The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. These stats aren't anything like those stats. You know, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, um, and data really drives that. And so that's where really the value of artificial intelligence comes into it. It maximizes the value of the raw data that we have. That's Dr. Patrick Lucy, chief scientist at Stats Perform, where they embrace the revolution. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. There is an HBO series called Westworld that allows users to take a virtual journey into an old West town and do literally whatever they want. In the sports data industry, the ability to mine new information and recreate the sporting past, it is here, and fortunately, there's nothing nefarious about this application. The conversation with Dr. Lucy, I promise you, really, really interesting. And later, you'll hear from Dr. Matthew Fedorik of the United States Anti-Doping Agency as they try to maintain competitive balance. Maybe those new AI stat applications can help, right? But first, the future is now. So 5G is coming and here, and so is sports gambling, and they're gonna intersect with one another which is a story that caught the eye of Sarah Krause from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, Sarah, how are you? Hey, I'm well. How are you? Good. Um, So 5G and sports betting, how do they get along? Sure. So uh, both are in the very early stages. So um, on the telecom side, 5G is slowly being rolled out in parts of cities across the U.S. by various different car- carriers that includes within some sports arenas. Um, and that's sort of the next generation of wireless service, um, much faster, much lower latency. At the same time, um, mobile sports betting is becoming legal in a growing number of states. And when you sort of combine the two together, what that facilitates is more sort of real-time and in-game betting than what's been possible or even legal here previously. Previously. Um, is there an issue with speed? Is that going to be a problem for the platforms that are providing opportunity to bet specifically in game where split decisions are going to be made? Sure. So, so there is a lot of in-game that is possible within 4G. And in the UK, for example, about 70% of the wagers that are placed in sports games are, are in-game. Um, but what 5G does is sort of turbocharges that and allows for bets on incremental plays or throws or you know the velocity of different things. There's there's sort of a combination of both the, the speed and also um, there's a growing use of sensors on balls, on players that, that create these sort of incremental wagers that you can place and, and do so in ultra fast almost real time because of how fast the wireless connectivity will be you know i remember a few years back when when all this stuff was speeding up and the stock market had to keep up with speed there were micro transactions that were kind of beating the system and i do wonder if there's any concern on the part of those who are going to provide sports betting opportunities that they're going to be people that are going to be able to use the speed to their advantage and game the system a little bit there is definitely a, a comparable, you know, potential arbitrage opportunity that comes. I think. I think there's also, um, which you also saw in financial markets, um, the the speed of predictive algorithms and you know, sort of synthesizing data really fast and certain people trying to fuse um, that data to make more informed wagers. So I think you do have a sort of financial markets comparison there in some ways, particularly in the early days, as um, you know, both. Um, sports teams and casino operators sort of get their arms around what all this looks like in practice. But I would assume, though, that everybody's happy about 5G, right? I mean, in the end, this opens up opportunities that didn't really previously exist. 
in the end, it is much faster wireless connectivity, and that is something that all the, the carriers are sort of gunning to roll out first and fastest um, in various places. It is a heavy lift. It is a very expensive thing to build out, and it requires a lot more sort of small cell infrastructure that's placed closer to where consumers are holding their devices. Um, but, but yeah, the hope is that, um, that that leads to potentially more fan engagement where you could, you know, stream one game while you're in the stadium while, you know, placing bets at the same time or, you know, at home you could stream multiple games or have your fantasy league up at the same time as, you know, a, a, a crystal clear video of, of the game that you're watching. So um, it's sort of the ability to have both multiple connected devices sort of running at once and doing multiple things on a device at the same time without it being overloaded or buffering. Yeah, we are hearing a lot in, in the broadcast space of second screen that is connected to gaming, betting, all yep. of those different things that are coming together and 5G is going to implement it. Sarah Krause from The Wall Street Journal, thank you so much. Thank you. Up next, Dr. Patrick Lucy on Next Gen Stats, and believe me, they are truly next gen. This is the Future Sport Podcast. The data era is here, and with gambling being legalized quickly throughout the United States, there's an appetite for the most accurate data points available. Dr. Patrick Lucy is the chief scientist at Stats Perform, which is two recently merged companies who are hoping to lead the way in that AI-powered data. Hi, Dr. Lucy. How are you? Hi, Bram. How are you, mate? Great. Um, what are you guys doing? Yeah, so uh, at Stats Perform, we're, we're, we're doing a lot. Um, so for the uh, listeners out there, if you haven't heard of us, I'm sure you, you touch us every day. So if you check a, a score on Google, whether it's a soccer score or at the end of a and at the end of a Super Bowl, um, you'll see statistical support would provided by Stats or Stats Perform. Uh, if you ask Apple Siri or if you ask Amazon Alexa a sports question, they get their data from us. So as an entity, um, you know we provide all the world's sports data. Um, I run the AI group, so I'm chief scientist here at Stats Perform. And as an AI scientist, it's just a wonderful place to be. Um, to do anything in terms of artificial intelligence, we want to be able to use all the data uh, possible. And here at Stats Perform, we have the deepest treasure troves of, of sports data. And so um, that allows us to do lots of cool stuff. Um, so whether you mentioned in terms of predictions for potentially powering gambling applications, we can do that. Uh, we've been collecting tracking data, uh, so player position data since 1999. So we have over 12,000 games worth of tracking data in, in soccer and over 6,000 games in, in uh, basketball. So we're creating team performance tools for that, which also power media applications. And also we're actually in the, in the midst of capturing or digitizing all the world's sports video using our body pose technology. So uh, we're doing a lot. So um, I, I think that's a, a very broad uh, um, and, and it's a very broad statement and it's uh, just a very high level summary of what we do. Uh, but I'm sure as we talk throughout this, uh, I can get a bit more specific. I want to get into the video in a moment because that's something that I didn't realize that Stats was doing um, as a sports consumer, fan, broadcaster. We've used your information for years. I do wonder now, um, I don't know if quartered the market was the way to put it for Stats for a number of years, but what is the competition like in this ecosystem now as there's been more companies that have gotten into sports data? Yeah, so sports is, uh, is definitely a competitive area. Um, and so we've been around for close to 40 years. So Stats um, was formed in 1981 and, and Perform had Opter um, and a lot of those companies. So we've been around for a very long time. And over that time, we've collected a lot of data. Um, given the interest in sport, uh, especially in the live domain, you know, there's been a lot of new competitors who have ventured into this market. But in terms of comprehensiveness, uh, people still uh, don't compare across all the verticals that we hit. And so just in terms of raw sports data, there's a couple other companies out there. In terms of capturing tracking data, there have been some recent um, entries into this market as well. 
But um, we have been pioneers in this area and, and we keep on uh, innovating in this space. So those who are familiar with tracking data in the, in, in the MBA, we created the SportView system, which, we, um, which was formed in 2008 and went in MBA-wide 2012-13. And that's across a lot of the, the soccer leagues in, in Europe as well. And so it is getting very, very competitive in this market, but in terms of co comprehensiveness, just collecting stats data, providing editorial and research, but also the raw stats to media and broadcasters, but also tracking solutions for team performance, um, you know, we, we, we are still the biggest and, and best at doing that. To continue to separate yourselves from these other competitors, what must you guys continue to do, grow and innovate? It's just innovation. Uh, so I think in uh, the movie Moneyball, um, you know, uh, it's a bit corny talking on the, on this podcast about um, Moneyball, but I think um, Brad Pitt in the movie said, you know, adapt or die. Um, and so, you know, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, um, and data really drives that. And so that's where really the value of artificial intelligence comes into it. It maximizes the value of the raw data that we have. It allows us to create applications. It allows users to get answers to sports questions that you couldn't answer beforehand. And, and that's really a mix between machine learning and um, you know creative design because that's the real value of what we're having with tracking data. Um, is being able to ask very granular questions and get the responses back. And, um, and, and it's really just to innovate and to maximize the value of the data that we have. And the tool that we use to do that is, is machine learning. So let's talk about some of your partners. So let's talk about broadcasting for a moment here. What do they want from you now that may be different from in the past in terms of the type of content that they would like to disseminate to fans? Well, in terms of broadcasters, so just at a high level, you have to think about what sports data is. And sports data is, in my view, is just reconstructing the story of a match. It's a really nice way of articulating what happened in a match in, um, you know, via numbers. Um, and so in terms of broadcasters, what they want to do is tell the best stories. And as we're seeing uh, the proliferation of mobile devices, people can consume sport wherever they are. Um, and it's gone more from a social occasion, more to a personal, so I can follow sport on my phone or my laptop, um, you know, wherever I may be, you know, I want to consume and understand sport. So in terms of broadcasters, they want to have the ability to personalize. They want the ability to tell the best stories, but also enable users to, and, and, their, and their viewers to find the best stories and, and, and really reach to everything that people find interesting. Um, so that's really where we're getting at. It's the ability to empower our broadcasters to tell the stories that they want and to hit the different ways that people consume sport, whether it is watching TV or whether it is watching on their mobile, whether it is over the top um, by their streaming service. So there's many ways to consume the data um, and consume sport our job is to enable the broadcasters to be able to do that whatever way they choose and, what, and whichever way that the viewers really want to consume the data and understand um, sport. And they might be asking you for three different stories now because we've talked to a lot of people about the second screen, third screen experience, and, and we'll get to gambling in a minute because that's going to play a large role in all of these major sports and the way that they disseminate the information, at least in America, maybe not worldwide. Um, so are they coming to you saying, we need multiple stories to tell here because we're going to be presenting the same thing in various different ways? Yeah, so that's a, it's a, that's a really interesting question. And it's not so much telling the broadcasters the stories, and this is a real art of artificial intelligence. We're not in the realm now of automating and telling domain experts what to do. The real key to technology is enabling or creating technology for the domain experts to ask the questions that they want and get an instant feedback. So instead of, so Bram, so you've got great experience in this field, you shouldn't rely on, on me or, or a company like Stats Perform to kind of tell you what to say. You've got your experience. You've got your 10, 20,000 hours in this domain. You know exactly what story you want to tell. You just want to find the data and the numbers to back that up or whether it's a visual, um, or whether it's a video clip. And so giving you the ability to ask that, 
that question via technology and you immediately get that response. That's really what we're focusing on, creating assistive technology just to help a domain expert like yourself to tell the story that you want. And it may not just be you, it may be people at home. And I know we'll talk about second, exper uh, second screen experiences later, but just getting people to ask the questions that they want and getting, that, um, getting the answers that um, they really want to, to, to know. Thank you um, for validating my uh, professional existence. I appreciate that. <laughs> there are some that want to no replace problem, us. No <laughs> right? Don't build the computer so great that that we're not uh, that we're not necessary any longer for this. I appreciate appreciate that. You well, it's very emotive, and uh, <laughs> we don't want to get too philosophical here. No. But you know, the machines are coming and, and whatnot. But um, you know, we have a long way to go, and um, it, there's a limit on what data can tell. You know, it doesn't sense a game it doesn't understand the game like a human yet and we're getting there but it's still a long way until we we can sense like a human and so we have to know the limitations on what data and technology can do and it's really that symbiosis between um you know domain expert like yourself and um technology just to make you um, do your job better and easier and more efficient yeah i mean yet is a str is an interesting word because as you know in recent years um, maybe not so much broadcasters, literal broadcasters, but print writers have been replaced by AI doing games that are essentially reports that are essentially just literally based on the data that's in front of them. And all of us in this industry push back and say, but they weren't there and they, they can't really tell the story. They can only use the data points. And, and that's not going to give a full picture to a fan. But were they, Bram? So I'll, I'll just uh, kind of double-click on that. Uh, the people who collected the data were there, or they were watching the game. Yeah. And so there was some human um, element there. So they were capturing the game and understanding that. And so what machine learning is able to do is kind of aggregate that and kind of to key points. So in terms of kind of that long tail, you're right, a lot of the sports stories that you see are automatically generated. But to get the color, to get the depth, that's really where a human expert can tell something which is compelling you know the, the big question for a reporter is do they want to tell that very basic story um, are we using their skills to their full capacity hmm. the answer is probably no they probably don't want to write that stuff um, and so they really want to do value add the stuff which can tell that deep story which people find compelling and a computer's not going to be able to do that and so it's kind of getting the humans to focus on what they really want to do and the most value on, on what they can provide instead of going broad. And, and that's what machine learning can do, enables us to scale. Uh, what we can uh, get humans to do is stuff that they're brilliant at that a, a computer can't do and, and won't do for a very, very long time. Uh, listen, a context is subjective, but subjectivity still matters. And that, <laughs> so if the machines can't figure out how to be subjective in context, we still have jobs and we still have a future in this absolutely, whole thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's talk about gambling for a moment. Um, it, it is moving quickly around this country. So can you kind of give us a sense of how you all are working with potential and current gambling platform partners? Yeah. So in terms of, of gambling, so, um, you know, we provide sports data, like uh, it doesn't matter who we provide it to, whether it's media, whether it's teams, um, it could be sports books. Um, you know, they want to consume information and they want to provide a service for their, um, for, for their customers. And so, you know, as I said before, we've been around for near 40 years and we've got the deepest treasure troves of data. So um, whether, again, you consume it on media or, or a sports book, you know, that data is there. So in terms of machine learning, um, where that um, is, becomes interesting is, you know, uh, the idea of providing predictions. And so for a game like a Super Bowl, um, you're going to have a lot of action. You're going to have a lot of people betting on that game. And somewhat, they, they call that an, a, an efficient market because if you have a million people watching a game and betting on a game, you can think of those as a million classifiers or a, a million machine learning classifiers who have full information. And so really in terms of getting a computer to beat the market in games like that, we have to be realistic and it's not really going to happen because again, there's a limit on what the data can do. Now, what's really exciting is that we could probably, um, or what we can do is provide predictions where markets don't exist or provide information where markets don't exist. And you can see that in player props um, and American sports uh, are set up beautifully for that. So you have, um, 
you know, American football is segmented, you know, so that it enables us, hey, at this down, at this yardage with this players on the field, you know, what's the likelihood that they'll run this play? Or what's the likelihood that a team will get to a first down? Or given that there's a field goal attempt, you know, what's the likelihood that there'll be completion there? So it allows us to provide predictions where they currently don't exist and you're not going to be able to create a market. And what I mean by create a market is just get people to, um, to make a prediction and we can rely on the data to do that. And that's really where deep learning, um, so I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but kind of modeling these non-linearities and doing personal predictions enable us to um, provide data which sports books could potentially use. Yeah. And also, it's not just that, but providing interactive, um, you know, I- interactive applications which could be compelling for, for, for users. Yeah, I, for users I, at home. I mean, I, I imagine in-game betting is going to be here very soon. Um, to just to what you were talking about, it's third and two. Uh, are they going to run the ball? Are they going to pass the ball? Here's an odd on them not successfully gaining a first down. Here's the odds on them doing so. Here's the specific odds of it's a sack or it's an interception or it's a fumble. You know, All of those things seem right. to be happening very quickly here. Yeah, you raise an excellent point there, um, and you can create the odds, but first of all, you have the data, you can provide a prediction, and the prediction doesn't have to relate to gambling. It could just relate to an interactive experience at home. Hmm. Um, you saw during uh, the spelling bee, you know, people could play along at home, and so you could have people just kind of like Madden, kind of making a forecast of what's happening. It doesn't necessarily have to tie to prediction, so we could provide that information, which could be consumed by media outlets or over-the-top applications, but also, you know, it could dr- drive, um, um, you know, action for a sports book. And so obviously they have to do some risk management around that. But at the end of the day, we're just providing information. And so it can be consumed many ways, not just for, for sports books, but, but, but obviously that's going to um, be a big market, you know, going forward. Um, you had mentioned video. Um, can you kind of talk about how that's being integrated into what you all are doing? Yeah, so video, so um, in terms of video, so that's basically the kernel of all sports knowledge. And so just say you and I watch a video, we can basically understand everything that's happened in the game via that video. And so using computer vision, we can actually digitize it. Uh, What I mean by digitize it is go from raw pixels to get it into a form where we can do some analysis, whether it's kind of detecting events or whether it's just locating where the players are. That's a way that we can consume uh, that data and get a computer to to make use of it. And so we've been pioneers in this space uh, via our SportView system. Um, And our SportView system... You know, we did this over a decade ago, and our sport view system is in venue where we have fixed cameras, um, where we track players at 25 frames per second. And we've done that for a long time in basketball and soccer. Now, that's great, but it's limiting. And so if you have a competition like the NBA, that's great. You, you uh, have all the teams. You have 30 arenas or 28 arenas where you can set that up. Now, what happens in Division One schools in, in basketball? You know, the operations and a lot of these colleges don't have the money to set up the infrastructure for that. So how do we get around that? And so getting tracking data has been limiting. But using the advances in computer vision, we can actually capture tracking data directly from broadcast. And so this is kind of the real key to AI. It it allows us to scale. And our goal now is to create tracking data for every college game that's ever been played or every basketball game that's ever been played. And that's very exciting because we can get that data to see how, um, to say, Michael Jordan played in the 80s um, you know, North Carolina, or we can see how, um, you know, pr- um, you, know you, you look at Zion this year, if we could track, um, we can capture the tracking data from North Carolina in, in the season's just gone. And so it allows us to do better comparisons. It allows us to expand our uh, footprint in terms of data. And it's really democratizing, just collecting tracking data from every game that's ever been played. And so not only is it useful for recruitment, um, you know, to make better decisions. You can see how players have evolved over time. It allows us to go back in time. Imagine if we can compare LeBron versus Michael Jordan. First of all, you need the tracking data to do that. But we can't go back in time and put tracking systems in those venues. 
but we do have that video. So we can actually capture that tracking data from the video and, and we have, uh, we call that the Autostats technology. And so we've licensed um, the, the best body pose detector out there, Open Pose from Carnegie Mellon University, which we have exclusive use um, in, in the field of use of sport. And so we're using that to basically collect tracking data from every game that's ever been played. Uh, well, then I guess I'll just ask you, is LeBron or Jordan better? You want to answer that question then? <laughs> well, as a visitor to your country, I'm from Australia. You know, I, I, I don't want to polarize opinion there. But, well, um, there's a right answer here, so I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity. Michael Jordan, correct? <laughs> correct, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, then I'll leave you with this, too, because um, since you, you are you're following all of this, and I do wonder if for what you know now about sports and success and all of these metrics that measure these players against one another, um, have we been telling the wrong story with the wrong stats in the past? Should we be focusing on something else? My answer is yes. I think we want to go beyond stats. We want to go beyond metrics. Um, metrics that are an aggregation. Metrics just give an overview. It's a summary. And it can really drill down into... Um, it can really drill down to a specific um, attribute of a player or a team, but it's really nailing down the context. And so when we kind of have metrics, we kind of wash over the context. And you mentioned context before, Bram. But really what we need to do is focus on the specifics. So the idea of personalization, the power of examples. So just say I had a, a play in basketball or a play in soccer. I can say, well, how often do they run that play? Or what, what's the likelihood of that player making that decision against that opponent? So metrics don't really get us there because it's an aggregate. What we want to do is be specific. And so, again, I don't want to get too philosophical here, but I think when we use metrics, it kind of washes out a lot of the important information. And so the ability to ask a very specific question and get a specific response back is really where we need to get to next. And using the power of machine learning, we can actually do that. And so um, hopefully that makes sense, and hopefully it's not too, um, you know, too um, nuanced there. It's incredibly interesting, and we'll see where the, the industry goes from here. Dr. Patrick Lucy is the chief scientist at Stats Perform. Thank you, Dr. Lucy. Great. Thanks, Bram. Up next, Dr. Matthew Fedorik from USADA on getting ahead of the performance enhancement curve. This is the Future Sport Podcast. So let's take a minute here to thank our friends at 3 Advance. These guys are ranked one of the nation's top app developers, but that's not all. They've helped grow a bunch of sports tech startups like Team Builder, T-Box Tour, and In-Game Fantasy. But they're also experts in user experience, cloud APIs, and artificial intelligence. So if you're looking for a dev partner to bring your future sport tech to life, look these guys up. Go to 3advance.com. They're the team to make it happen. At Advance, you will. That's the number 3advance.com. And tell them Future Sport sent you. Tech moves fast, and so do methods by which athletes can attempt to enhance performance. Our guest this week is Dr. Matthew Fedorik, who is the Chief Science Officer at the United States Anti-Doping Agency, whose role is to stay a step ahead and ensure the sanctity of competition. Hi, Dr. Fedorik. Thanks for taking the time. Hey, good morning. Pleased to be with you today. I, I got to open with this because you recently presented a medal, right, at the Pan Am Games? That happened? I did. It was at the Pan American Games down in Peru a couple of weeks ago. So... How are you not skeptical of everyone competing at this level? Well, in, in the business, you know, we, we're, doing, we're doing our best to keep competition clean, and, and we want to level the playing field, and the vast majority of athletes are doing it the right way, and it's our job to make sure that we're uh, staying a step ahead to keep ahead of the doping methods and substances that, that athletes are using to try to get ahead but the vast majority of athletes i think if you, you get too cynical in this business then um i think you've uh you know you can't come to work every day and and 
be happy with the work you do. So we got to look at it from the point of view of being positive and knowing that we're the majority of athletes are doing it right. You know, that's interesting because you, you, that's never the headline, as you know. It's whenever someone is actually caught, that that's what the headline is going to be. Um, but you are fairly certain in what you do that actually the majority of people are doing this the right way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, all athletes, I think you got to go back to the reasons athletes compete in sport. And, of course, they're, you know, at the highest level of sport, um, there is some opportunity to, to make, uh, you know, financial well-being and uh, make it a, at the top echelons of sport. But for the vast majority of athletes, they're not getting rich. And so why are they participating in sport? It's because they love what they do. They love the thrill of competition. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, we, we think that the vast majority of athletes are, are doing it the right way, but they also want a level playing field. So they need organizations like USADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and our partners around the world to uh, police sport. How did you end up in this, in this line of work? <laughs> it's a great question. I, I got my PhD in pathology and lab medicine, and I was doing prostate cancer research and uh, got into working with, in the biotech field and it was developing new drug delivery systems and realized that I wanted to mold my passion of science with my background in sport. I grew up as a downhill ski racer in Canada, um, and it seemed like the perfect opportunity to try to get into a field that was, uh, you know, molding my love of sport with my passion for science. And I, I got a job uh, with the Vancouver 2010 organizing committee setting up a laboratory that was used to test all the samples for the games. And it just kind of snowballed from there. And uh, one day I got a call from my boss, the CEO of USADA, Travis Tiger, saying uh, there's an opportunity down in Colorado Springs and was I interested? And I was here three weeks later and, and that hmm. was eight years ago. So what is your role now? How would you describe what you do? Uh, so as the chief science officer, I'm responsible for both the science and research program at USADA as well as the drug reference and therapeutic use exemption department. So if an athlete needs a to use a prohibited substance or method, there's a process by which they can get approval to do that. My daily role is pretty diverse. I assist our legal team with results management cases. I liaise with our WADA accredited laboratories on making sure samples are analyzed properly and the results are interpreted um, accurately. I work together with our comms team and our education team to develop science-related content to get out to our athletes and athlete support personnel. Um, and my team is intimately involved with making sure that we're devising the most effective uh, detection and deterrence program that we possibly can to stay ahead of the cheaters. And, and that clearly is happening here. Um, obviously, you have to work with other institutions around the world. Um, how does that kind of coordinate with one another? Yeah, it's a great question. There's there's over 600 uh, world anti-doping code signatories around the world that run anti-doping programs. And for the vast majority of, of U.S. athletes, um, that are in our uh, jurisdiction, uh, we do testing on them while they're on U.S. soil. When an athlete travels internationally to a competition, um, they may be tested by another agency or, or in competition um, at their event. So we liaise with, with other anti-doping programs to make sure we can coordinate testing um, at those highest levels. We also, on the scientific front, liaise with our partners to understand, you know, what's going on globally with the, the, the uh, discovery of new pharmaceuticals, with uh, patterns of doping that others are seeing, and, and really wanting to understand, you know, how to be most effective with testing by uh, talking continually with our various colleagues around the world to understand, you know, what they're doing, how they're doing testing, um, and how to make sure that we're designing our program um, in the best possible way. Uh, are the standards under, for what you understand, are, are they upholding the same standards around the world that USADA is? Yeah, so everybody is a, a, a world anti-doping code signatory, and under that there's a number of 
you know, many different requirements in order to run um, an effective anti-doping program. And, and um, one of the comments we get from athletes regularly is, are my competitors being held to the same uh, level and, and accountability as, as, as I am? And so that, that's currently, you know, I think there's, there's um, improvements and harmonization that could happen still, and it's all about the delivery of those standards and making sure that, that everyone, you know, no matter if you're a Kenyan athlete or compete in the UK or a US athlete or a Canadian athlete, the level of testing is sufficient in order to detect and deter. I think we still have a ways to go to harmonize that entire system, but um, we're working to, you know, the maximum possible level to make sure that our program is the gold standard. Um, there was a mention of some of the types of testing that you're doing, and I want to ask you about some of them because they're not out there publicly um, that are disseminated and what people discuss as you guys try to um, manage all of these competitions. Uh, dry blood spot testing, what is that? Yeah. Yeah, so dry blood spot testing has been around since the 1960s in the clinical world, um, neonatal testing, taking small amounts of blood. One of the challenges we have is that anti-doping is invasive, and, and we want to continually push the envelope to make it more athlete-friendly um, and collect samples in a way that are being you know, the most effective, and if we can collect more samples in a shorter period of time, that increases both our ability to um, not inconvenience athletes and also collect perhaps more samples in order to uh, in order to detect and deter. So with dry blood spots, this is a way of collecting a lower volume of blood. And right now, when we collect blood, we need to send it to a laboratory within a specific point in short period of time in order to make sure that blood isn't spoiled by the time it arrives. And dry blood spots offer the advantage that the blood stability is better because that blood dries on a card and can be sent through the normal, you know, courier mail system in order to arrive at the laboratory. Obviously, you have some limitations with dry blood spots because of that lower volume of blood, but if we can use dry blood spots as a complementary method to current urine and blood collection, it's another tool in our toolbox that we can use to detect specific substances both directly and indirectly through biomarkers that we can uh, measure quantitatively or qualitatively on that card. Performance targeting. Can you kind of address how you go about performance targeting? Yeah, good, good, great question. So obviously we're looking at gathering as much information as we can on athletes to understand which athletes we should have in our registered testing pool, and then once they're in the testing pool, using the limited resources we have effectively to target the right athlete at the right time with the right test. So using performance data, and that's data that we gather based on competition results, um, where an athlete may be traveling, and how they're uh, performing when they go abroad or, or compete in the United States, we can use uh, different mathematic, mathematical modeling to understand whether an athlete is performing you know, at their best or even above their best um, in a way that can help devise you know, a risk assessment essentially on individual sports and individual athletes to make sure that we can assign those tests and time those tests in the most effective manner. Um, and oral fluid testing, can you address that? Yeah, oral fluid testing, again, like dry blood spots, is a way that we can add another matrix to our toolbox in order to test athletes. And, and oral fluid testing is, will be most beneficial in competition when you're looking for substances that, an ath that are prohibited only when an athlete competes. And we're looking to differentiate between the ingestion of a substance during the out of competition period versus something that is only in their system during in competition. Right now with urine, that window, we're trying to expand that window to be as wide as possible. And when we're looking at in comp substances, we're looking at a much narrower window. So oral fluid could be a way in order to better inform us as to 
whether an athlete used those substances just a short time ago um, in order to possibly enhance their performance in competition. Listen, I've always been curious about the window, and I don't know how it's changed through the years. You would probably know that as, as well. But in general, if you are suspecting that someone is enhancing their performance, is there kind of a rule of thumb of how much time you have to test this person before they would pass? Yeah, it's a great question, and I'm not going to divulge any trade secrets, but yeah. <laughs> one, one thing I can say is that the advancements in science are critical, and, and we're part of an organization called the Partnership for Clean Competition, together with Major League Baseball, the NFL, um, the PGA, the US OPC, um, as well as others, and, and we dedicate scientific research dollars to grants to advance the detection capacity of uh, the methods and the laboratories that employ those methods. The discovery of new metabolites, um, urinary metabolites, as well as um, long-term metabolites that, that exist in the urine and are excreted over a much longer time frame after that initial ingestion are game changers in the way that they allow that detection window to be expanded together with the increase in laboratory sensitivity we're detecting levels of compounds down to the trillionth of a gram per milliliter. Um, and to give that you an idea of what that is, that's less than a drop in an Olympic-sized swimming pool of concentrations of these substances. So the sensitivity and the specificity of the testing has increased exponentially, which allows us to, you know, in some cases, we can go back and retest samples that we have in storage and catch people that they may have not been caught five years ago with the analytical technology that we had then, but now we're able to pick things up that we weren't before. So in that way, we're staying you know, one step ahead of the cheaters, and they never know what those detection windows really are. Huh. So almost cold case. Cold, like you had suspicions, and you, the science has changed, and you can now cold case some of these things. Yeah, in some cases, you know, you see announcements every so often, especially from samples that are kept um, from previous Olympic um, or Paralympic Games about the retesting of those samples before the statute of limitations expires. And we do the same thing. We have freezers full of urine and blood samples that we can go back to. Um, and based on, you know, even non-analytical evidence, we can go and reanalyze samples in hopes of, um, getting a, a presence of a prohibited substance. Mm. Um, I do wonder this too, and this is something else that, that isn't really disseminated much. And I'm not, again, I, I don't want to mess with trade secrets here, but you know, we do hear about athletes who do cheat and oftentimes it is glazed over with a vague, they were using this or they were using that. I, I do wonder how much change is there by methods year to year to attempt to skirt the system? How, how does the fight for you all change on an annual basis? Yeah, I often get asked the question, you know, what keeps me up at night and, and what are athletes doing to try to, to, try to circumvent the testing? And, and I would say the biggest challenge right now is the, the, the use of endogenous substances that our bodies produce and athletes trying to supplement their own hormone or steroids that their bodies produce in hopes of enhancing their performance. So specifically, I'm talking about compounds such as EPO, urethropoietin, that increases our red blood cell count or testosterone dosing. Our bodies all produce testosterone. So the challenge for the testers is to be able to dif differentiate between what's supposed to be in our bodies and what's added um, from the outside and administered in a way to, with the intent of cheating. And so um, subjecting those samples to specific, uh, really sophisticated analytical techniques to be able to uh, figure those things out and, and make sure that science is sound to really understand, um, you know, how an athlete may be using those and, and to make sure that we're not, um, you know, there's no false positives. Is, is one of the biggest challenges and, and we need to, we can't do those tests on every single sample. So we have to employ techniques such as the athlete biological passport where we're monitoring biomarkers in every single urine and blood sample that we collect. And then we, when we see variability 
that may be outside of the normal physiological range, we can then assign those specialized tests to specific samples in hopes of detecting those um, endogenous hormones or steroids that we're looking for. It's fascinating what you do. I'll, I'll leave you with this. You know, we're less than a year out from the Olympic Games in Japan. Um, the USADA Science Symposium is in Tokyo. W- what were the focuses there? Yeah, so the focus this year is emerging drugs and technologies. We're going to spend some time talking about new analytical techniques. The, the, the bread and butter around what we do in the lab is based on mass spectrometry and so we're spending a day talking about advances in in mass spec that allow for increases in sensitivity and and specificity while keeping uh, costs low. We're going to spend some time talking about gene doping and advances in that area um, as well as performance profiling um, and how we can start to become more sophisticated and possibly use techniques such as artificial intelligence and machine learning to really um, develop a, a more sophisticated way to, to dynamically analyze um, individual athlete risk and be able to assign those tests in the best possible um, effective manner. Dr. Matthew Fedorik is the Chief Science Officer at the United States Anti-Doping Agency. Thank you, Dr. Fedorik. You're very welcome. Pleased to speak with you today. That will do it for us this week. Remember, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3advance.com. That's the number 3advance.com.